Welcome to uh, today's seminar, which is a special one. Um, because today we have uh, Janet Herring as our guest. And she will talk about Ask Me Anything. And then she put between brackets about Ayalak. <laughs> so the trick for you will be to prepare questions where you ask questions about Ayalak and at the same time ask something about Janet. <laughs> okay. Um, I think I don't really need to introduce Janet, but, but just a couple of things that you, that you see how impressed her career was. Um, she worked at various institutes with the highest rankings in the world. Um, she did a bachelor in chemistry at Cornell. Then she did a master in chemistry at Harvard. Uh, PhD in Massachusetts Institute of Technology, so MIT. Then she was assistant professor at the University of California. Associate and full professor at Caltech, full professor at ETH and EPL. And if you take all this, they are the first 15 rankings worldwide. <laughs> and then, because there was nothing more, not better, she became director of EWAC. Um, 16 years between 2007 until the end of the year. We, we talked about that in October already. Um, I also talked that, that, that it is not only an impressive career, but also the, uh, the track record about publications and all this stuff. So I don't need to repeat that. Today, you will give your seminar, which will be something like 20 minutes. And then afterwards, we will have the chance to, all, to ask all the questions we would like to ask Janet. Until around 5 o'clock, and then we will see what happens. Thank you. Okay, so Rick already mentioned two very important points. One is that I did put this qualifier um, about AILHOG. So if you brought questions about the uh, global geopolitical situation, those have to wait to the outro. Okay. Um, also, as Rick mentioned, I only have um, 20 slides. So it should take me about 20 minutes. So um, there will be plenty of time for questions. So I, especially since I, I made this short, I didn't want to cover a whole bunch of boring background stuff that you hear over and over again, structure of the ETH domain, blah, 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 blah. Um, but I wanted to give you a little bit of insight about how I would see things and how I've sort of tried to guide Avog over these last 16 years. And I think that it's easier to have a set of principles, sort of framework conditions and work from that rather than trying to make rules for everything in advance. So this is one of the ways in which I, I sort of see Elod's positioning, and that is that fundamentally we have to maintain excellence. Right? If we don't maintain excellence, our partners don't trust us, we can't get our work taken up into policy and practice, we can't have joint activities with um, high-ranking universities, and we want to be able to do all of that. So that's sort of a a, a basis for our work. In addition to that, I think we have some aspects that we can really pursue more than is easy to do in a university setting, and that is to really emphasize inter- and transdisciplinary research um, because we're not bounded by specific disciplines, so we don't have to belong to a particular department. And then, um, then we can also work at multiple scales in space and time, and lastly, we can engage with policy and practice, and all of these things really take continuity. Right? So if you're going to do this kind of work, you can't have somebody new rotating into it all the time. The stakeholder that you're calling is not super interested in talking to a new person every six months, um, but if you have a really a long-standing relationship, you can get a lot done, and I think that we have over time. So here are a few of the principles that, that I felt have, have been guiding me in, and I hope that I've translated that into the rest of Avod. And the first is to look for the best people we can, but those people have to have their interests aligned with Avod's mandate. I and mean, if somebody comes in and really wants to do something different, everybody's gonna be unhappy in the end. Um, hopefully when we bring in these really excellent people, um, we can provide them with the support and framework conditions that are conducive to their success. And I think that, um, fortunately, given the generosity of the Swiss taxpayer, that we're really able to do that. 
And then we also have some internal funding. And I have to say, I didn't create this. This was already in place when I got to LBI as a director to have a pool of money for to use strategically to develop new directions, to promote intern transdisciplinary research, and, and to strengthen our positioning. So what we really want to do then from the directorate and hopefully have this sort of percolate down is to maintain an overarching perspective that considers our internal capabilities in the context of external opportunities and demands. And if we can do this effectively, I think that we can be very successful. So um, you've seen this picture before. Um, this is really uh, that Elvog is the people who work here. And these are all the people that have been hired since I, I got to Elvog as research group leaders. Um, and I heard some complaints about this because the people who hired in as joint professors are not on this picture, even though they were on the stage at the party, which I have to say was really lovely. What you do see here is that some of these people have really moved up in our hierarchy already, um, that we have people of the caliber that can get joint professorships, um, adjunct professorships, move up to be our department heads. And so what I did then was in addition to this slide, I have a, you see Katrin and, and Florian are here because they were hired by Elog, even though now they are appointed as joint professors. And now on this next slide, they join the other people who are appointed as joint professors um, during my tenure. And now you see the blue um, outlining around the boxes that indicates people who are appointed as joint professors when they are already had either at Elog or had some experience at Elog. And so what you see here is that if you work at Elvog, it, it actually positions you quite well for these opportunities, right? So a significant number of these people already had this experience and were able to move into those positions. So this is, these are the people, you guys, right? You're the future of the institution. And I think that when we hire the right people um, and give them the right conditions, then they are the ones, you are the ones who will deal with the challenges of the future as they come up. And unlike some people, I really don't think that I can project all of those challenges and opportunities and plan for them. I think that what I can do is, is hire good people and let them uh, react when, it, when the time comes. So um, when I started Elvon, uh, actually before I started Elvon, I gave a um, presentation in the, to a hiring committee and I was able to sneak that into um, a uh, <clears throat> Voices of Analog blog that I wrote about why I do not have a 10-year plan for Analog. We do have a five-year plan, in case you're wondering, or four-year plan, um, and that's our development plan. So every four years, we have one of those. Um, we're still in the middle of the 21-24, and the next one will be 25-28. Um, but when I wrote this particular piece, I put in a link so you can find it if you want to the presentation I made um, when I was um, being recruited as director. And there were a couple of things that I pointed out that I think are, are still very relevant today. And that is that AILHOG's um, capabilities that are real opportunities come from this com uh, combination of really excellent people and excellent facilities. And that gives us a unique positioning to move forward. Um, and what I said when I, when I finished this talk was what I needed to do if I were hired as director of Elog would be um, to really learn about what was going on here. And even though I had been a postdoc, that was a long time ago. Um, and to understand what the opportunities were and to try and develop with the colleagues a plan for the future. I have to say, um, the search committee did not find that particularly compelling. <laughs> <laughs> The first time they didn't like what I had to say, uh, not the last. Anyway, um, but that was my idea going forward. So, so where did I go? Um, or, or how did I see Elvog at the time? When I, when I got to Elvog, I started learning about it. I, I put together this picture of, of how I see Elvog's uh, competencies. And I see sort of three main big areas, chemistry, biology, and engineering. And then there are other areas that are more um, overarching or, or sort of connecting, um, and, but not as central um, as those three. And those are the social sciences, surface and groundwater hydrology and geology, physics and 
uh, remote sensing, modeling, and data sciences, and then development in the sense of um, uh, developing countries. And the issues always are when we want to move forward, do we maintain, are we hiring somebody retires or hiring? Do we maintain these core competences? How do we expand when we feel it's necessary? How do we develop new competences, including um, with partners? And how do we set priorities? Okay, so I want to give you a couple of examples of how I saw some developments there. And this goes back to, um, oh, sorry, and, um, and this is one example that comes from the um, first peer review that I participated in as a, from the EVOC side. I participated in one before from the peer side. And so this is an, what has happened at EVOC in environmental social sciences, starting with this picture from 2008, where we had um, a department called Innovation Research and Utility Sectors. And it was a rather small department. Um, it had a couple of permanent people, those are these two here, and a bunch of non-permanent people. Um, and it was very focused, right? There were also, at the same time, quite a few other social scientists at EVA in different departments. They weren't all together. And so at a certain point, it made sense to try and consolidate this and to have more visibility and really bring it forward. And so if you look at social sciences today, we have the environmental social sciences department. It covers a lot more um, areas. It has a lot more people in it. It's led now by Manuel Fisher. And it really benefited very much from the activities of Bernhard Trufer, who was the head of CIRRUS for many years, and then also the head of ESS when it started, and is one of EVA's most highly cited researchers. I don't see him here today. But um, it's you know, really a tribute to his efforts that how well social sciences has developed in Avog. And I think it's now really a strong area and not a sort of little, sort of weaker um, little sister to the whole thing. So that's one area where there's been a big growth, right? So it started from something that was not really a core activity at Avog, but now is very well and integrated and embedded and supports the entire activities of the institution. A contrast to that is engineering. Engineering was always very strong at EVA, and still is. And when I came in in 2007, I gave a, a seminar about engineering in the aquatic environment. And the reason that I did that um, was that I felt that engineering would be very important for the future of EVA, that it was a benefit to EVA to have science, natural sciences social sciences and engineering all in the same institution. I still think it's actually a, a disadvantage for ETH that they've separated environmental engineering and sciences, but that's a totally separate story. Um, in the US, these are much more often together. And so I decided to use that as a topic of my first um, seminar. And one thing, I, I, two things I talked about that really came from my experience, especially living in Los Angeles, one was the idea of decentralized treatment, right? So the idea that you didn't do everything completely centralized, um, this is already fairly prominent in Los Angeles because it's a, it's a water scarce environment. It's not like Switzerland at all. And so I put that forward as something that also had been talked about and was being done at EMA, this question of how do you manage this continuum between decentralized and fully centralized systems. Then the other thing that I talked about was the issue of urban drainage and different types of management of um, urban water systems, especially related here to you know, what we now call blue-green infrastructure. But this is trying to understand how you put together the natural processes that happen in urban area with the constraints of things like um, paving everything over, which is generally not a good idea. So if we think about where Elbog is today in terms of engineering and how it relates, I think that, that really huge steps have been made in both of these areas. I have to say not because I introduced them at all, they were already in place, but it's sort of something that really made sense to everybody. On the um, alternative treatment models, we now have the nest building, which I hope everybody has has seen, um, and there we have really um, an important model demonstration of how to manage different water streams and 
and treat them. And then in terms of the urban water management, we have a, a fairly large program in blue green infrastructure in the SVB department. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, this is something that had been thought about at AMOD for a long time when I came, but I think that things came together from the side of the directorate, from the um, interests of the researchers, and from the opportunities and needs of the time to really move these things forward. So I'm very pleased that both of those developed in that way. Then um, it's, uh, it's important to know that um, the continuity also played a huge role in this. So this is, um, a, I'm quite fond of it actually, a sort of history, a source separation ally that, that we commissioned from an environmental historian. It just shows one of the pictures here actually goes back to 1992, right? And that's where some of the first thinking about source separation was being developed coming up to current day. And there are a few faces here. Tove was really one of the people who was back at the, almost at the beginning of these discussions. Judith came in a little bit later. And then we have people like Bastian who are now involved in the spin-off Luna and, and Sabina who has really developed these directions um, in a really nice way. And so this, this long-term continuity is something that allows AMOG to move these kinds of, um, of programs forward. And this is, this is very hard if you're only thinking in, in small chunks and you can't count on the next um, project coming through. So that's something I think is a really nice um, aspect of Keva. Another thing is the importance of positioning for new opportunities. So back in 2016, that was when the people were first in the ETH domain, first starting to talk about the Swiss Data Science Center. And I saw this slide um, without, the, without the little blue circles and box and lines here. I saw this slide is presented by ETH Zurich, and I thought, oh, we could put Airlog on that, right? So that Airlog would have an opportunity to benefit from this activity in the ETH domain on data science, and that was actually quite successful. So what you see now, if you look at our uh, most recent annual report, is that, in fact, data science has been taken up and implemented in, in this case, um, using machine learning monitor our phytoplankton communities. This is a way in which we've been able to move forward in an area because of the strengths and expertise in the ETH domain. And I think that's um, a really nice aspect of working at AMA. So um, that all looks like totally positive. Of course, it's not exactly entirely a bed of roses. There are also some challenges. Uh, this is one of them. <laughs> so um, <laughs> certainly, and I have to say, if you haven't heard of this book, Mistakes Were Made But Not By Me, I really recommend it very strongly. Um, it's, there's always, there's always uh, going to be mistakes, and, um, and you can get yourself into a little bit of hot water and a little bit of difficulties, <laughs> but it's really important to learn from those mistakes, right? So one of the, the I think, the simple message out of this and I hope everybody remembers it, is nothing. Nothing is confidential, nothing, okay? So if you're gonna put something in an email, you have to expect that it might end up in a blip. <laughs> um, <laughs> at any rate, but in, aside from just that kind of you know, cautionary tale, I think it's also important that from these kinds of experiences, you learn also what what you believe, you know, what your principles are. And because of that, um, I, I wrote actually, even before this particular incident, I had written an, an article or a letter to the editor of Environmental Science and Technology explaining how I saw freedom of expression for Elbon researchers. And then after this, to make sure that people were, were aware of it, I wrote another piece in our Voices of Elbon blog to emphasize that certainly in my view, also in the view of UNESCO, um, the American Association of University Professors and many other international bodies, scientists, faculty, whoever, have the right to express their political opinions, also religious, also everything else, um, in a way that, that also takes advantage of their professional expertise. It just has to be done in a, in a, a way that doesn't totally involving the, the institution that they work with. So you can read more about that if you're interested later, 
but um, I think it, it is an important principle for the future and for AI success. So moving along to, again, to the future is that I think there are some challenges. Um, these have also been present in, in previously, but they become more uh, significant, I think. And that is that um, the funders more and more expect to be able to see concrete benefits from the, the funding that they give to institutions like AIBOT. And the good thing for us is that our topic, water, becomes more and more important. So it's relatively easy for us to argue that, um, that we're working in the right area. There's also an issue that um, employees are expecting more from their working environment. If you follow the news from the United States, you might notice that the graduate students at the University of California, Berkeley, are on strike, which is kind of a big deal. And, um, and they're on strike because the working conditions are so bad. So this is something that I think we always have to take into account and figure out how to work well with our employees. Um, researchers expect to be able to exercise autonomy, to be respected for their contributions, and to have opportunities for professional development. I think that's perfectly reasonable. And the, the, student, the people we train, our students, our doctoral students and junior colleagues, expect that their training is going to prepare them for their future. Now, not every one of them is going to go into academics, and, and that's perfectly fine, but they should be prepared then to also for non-academic fields. So I think those are, are challenges that AMOG will have to deal with in the future, along with basically everybody else. So AMOG's uh, research is really very timely. It's very relevant. There are a lot of crises that are facing um, societies, including the, the research community. And, and these are just a couple of them. But so if we're going to do this, this timely and relevant research, it also would be good if it were actionable. So what I mean by that for actionable research is research that informs decisions, improves policy design, um, and or serves as the basis for implementation and practice. And then it's really connected to there. It's not just like, yeah, that could, you could, somebody else could do that, right? Um, and the way that I think of it is there are sort of three components. One is if something is going to be actionable, it needs to address a, a real need. You know, not, not just to be out there and there's nobody to pick it up and no, no need for it. Um, <clears throat> if we're going to do it, it needs to fit with our research capabilities. There's a... excuse me, it's no point in trying to extend ourselves into areas where we don't have expertise, though of course we can always learn. And then finally, we should think about opportunities, that is partners, implementation partners who would pick things up and actually put them into practice. And the closer we work with those people in developing our research, the better the chances that they'll be able to use it when we feel like we're ready to sign off. Okay, <clears throat> so, this brings me to the idea of how do we use our resources well, right? So I, I came up with this idea that if you think about performance as a function of security or comfort level of resources, if the resources are really um, insufficient, it doesn't work. You know, people are just totally stressed out all the time. They're anxious. They kind of focus in really narrowly. What can they get done? They're not willing to take risks. As the, um, the resources increase, that, that's actually, you, you reach a point where people are then become flexible. They're, they're willing to take risks, they're willing to think critically because they feel a bit comfortable. So that's a really nice place to be, it's self-motivated. But then what happens? So what happens when your resources increase past that point? Well, <laughs> there are two possibilities. And one possibility is that the um, performance actually goes down. And what happens there is that um, people get start to feel really entitled. You know? So it, it gets sort of self-centered, there's complacency, there's lack of critical thinking, it's sort of a business of usual attitude. This is, this is a waste, right? Um, and, but there is an alternative. And I, what I really hope is that Alec goes in this alternative direction. I think that we do already, I hope that we do continue to. And that is to think of being generous, right? So that, that not just holding all the resources to ourselves, but thinking, how can we extend this? How can we share these benefits? How can we gain allies and partners 
and really focus on the work that we want to see being done and drive our resources in that direction. So I think that's, you know, sort of I hope where things go in the future. So I'd like to stop with, end with some thanks. And first is this really to the directorate. Um, what you see here are um, the five people who are in the directorate at the time that I came. And what happened then was that there was some natural turnover. Some of it was quite quick. Uh, Roland Schoenleib retired the same year that I started. Uh, Willie Goyer just a little bit afterwards. And then we started having some new people come into the directorate, Yuka, who's still there. Then we see Hans Rudi Sigrist, who is only on the directorate for two years, but it was really nice that he was able to step in after Willie retired to make sure that we had engineering covered. Um, and then when Hans Rudi retired, then Tobe was, was ready to join the directorate. So that was, that was really nice. Johnny um, was also not for so long in the directorate, but he followed Bernhard uh, Verily, who was, was really giving us a strong link to Kashtarama. And I think that's also one of the really important things. And Johnny did that um, until last year. And now Karsten is, um, Schubert is sort of filling that, that role for us to, to link to the directorate. So what you see here is there's, there's natural turnover as people um, develop in their careers and then eventually retire, also like me. And then you see one picture here, there are no dates underneath it. Right? And that's because um, Rick was already in the directorate when I started, like these, these others in the, in the top row, and, um, and he hasn't left yet. So for me, <laughs> for me, this was a, a huge benefit because I had, not just from Rick, but also the other directorate members, real institutional knowledge. How did Alvog function? What was going on? Where, what was the current status of things when I came? And I think that... Um, that Rick, I'm sure well, Rick will do this um, and for the next transition as well, which is a, a super advantage. And so he gets no dates, but a little frame. So <laughs> thanks very much. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then the future. So in my talk in 2007, I did have one um, slide that said, what about the future? And what I did there was I quoted a very famous um, baseball player for the United States, Yogi Berra, who said, predictions are difficult to make, especially about the future. <laughs> and, but we have an advantage here at AMI that we do know some things about the future. We know that Martin will be the next director. Today, he's at the Weizmann Institute in Israel. Um, but I'm sure he will be very interested to hear all the questions and answers that come up in the next um, 20, 40 minutes or so, half an hour. So basically, we have a lot to celebrate. But before we do that, I would like to give people a, a chance to ask um, questions about AMOG. And I have to tell you right now, if you're going to ask me facts and figures, then um, that's Rick's job. So, <laughs> so I'll stop there and um, open the floor. <laughs>